Hi, everybody. Uh, just another quick reminder that the Slido up there is so you can ask any questions. So there's going to be a research panel where Mr. Spenner over here will be asking the questions to our panel. But at the end, there'll be a Q&A part where the audience can ask any questions. So please go to the Slido um, and put, enter the code. And also feel free to like any questions that you think are interesting. Because near the end, we probably won't have time for all the audience questions, just the ones that are the most liked. So any question you want to see answered, please use the like button. And yeah, Mr. Spenner, take it away. All right, thank you, Kavita. Let's give a round of applause to the wisdom officers and to Ms. Chetty for bringing this in the One more quick thank you to the IT people and Mr. Larson and all of the other Hap Parker staff who make this day possible. Thank you. So yeah, I am Mr. Spenner. I teach the research classes here, uh, and I teach AP Physics C. I've got a new exciting elective called System Science coming up next semester. Um, and I have the pleasure of working with many of these seniors. In fact, all these seniors I've worked with at some point. Um, so I'll introduce them briefly, uh, see, in, in kind of in the order of my notes. But the first on the second to last at the end there is Sazvath. Uh, Sazvath actually was the MC for the same panel session last year. So if I start to go off on an uncontrollable rant, he will step in. Probably I'll be talking about complex systems or um, ethics or who knows what. Um, uh, Angela is over second from this end. Uh, Angela, what you see on stage here is actually not all of Angela. It's one eigenstate of her complete wave function. Um, she's actually existing in multiple parallel universes right now. Um, Natasha. Uh, there's Natasha. Natasha has been enrolled in my research classes since 2019. Uh, for that entire time, she has been policing the use of statistics in my classes um, and reporting wrongdoers. So thank you, Natasha. Um, and then we have uh, Harsh. Harsh is wait, wait for Harsh. Uh, Harsh is going to upload his consciousness into a neural network so that he can return every year. We'll just wheel a computer out every year and he'll be back. If it's, uh, and then we have Prakrit. Um, at his current pace, Prakrit, we expect, will discover at least two or three new scorpion species somewhere in this auditorium sometime <laughs> in the next 40 minutes. Um, and Alice. Alice uh, is the president of the research club this year. Um, she's been an officer for several years and is, to my knowledge, an officer of at least 123 other student clubs and organizations. So congratulations. Um, Alice makes things happen. Uh, so this group of students, seniors is here to um, Oh, and, I've got, and of course we have uh, Sazgar's father at the far end. I'll introduce him in more detail later because he'll get a special speaking role, but he will address the parents directly with his own wisdom. Uh, and indeed, that is the goal for this panel session. We want all these students to share their wisdom with you all um, and to talk a little bit about their paths through the Herker Research Program. Uh, we will, as, as mentioned, we will have some time for audience Q&A, so please feel free to post those questions and we'll get to them as we have time. Um, first, I want to take a quick view at, or skip that. We'll take a quick overview of some of the support systems that Harper offers to students at the upper school. Uh, we coordinate a number of different competitions. Um, among them are the Regeneron uh, STS competition, that one's for seniors only. Uh, I'm just going to highlight these briefly, and then the students will actually cover them in much more detail later on. Uh, USAYPT. Um, did some, uh, so I was about to do that, right? Okay, so, so we'll get more detail about that later. That's the U.S. Association of Young Physicists Tournament. It's a great program. Um, there's a lot of competitions that go on here to uh, pay, pen and paper, uh, test-based exams, but these are the actual research competitions that we support. USAYPT is special because it's the one program where students work on par with physics faculty to, con to conduct a project, and they go and they have little physics debates about their findings. It's a great program. Uh, and then, of course, Synopsis is the regional science fair uh, that we just wrapped up back in March. Um, and we have many dozens of students who participate in that every year. And outside of competitions, we have a number of support mechanisms. We have uh, the academic classes that I teach, for example. There's a one-year, uh, actually soon to be one semester, uh, research methods class, which is for anybody who wants to take it. Just if you're curious about doing science, this is the class for you. Um, there is a advanced research class that is independent study, so you can pursue whatever your interest may be. Uh, we have a number of clubs. I won't even list them all. Um, the research club I'm list you're probably familiar with just by virtue of being here, but there's many others, including medical and computer science-oriented, competitions-based. Um, 
We have uh, uh, some degree of science internship support often go happening through those clubs. Uh, and we have the Open Lab program, which is uh, a way for students to get access to our wet lab resources uh, here on campus outside of normal school hours. Uh, so all these things will be covered in more detail as we as we get responses from the panelists. So let's jump into that. In fact, we're going to start by inviting the panelists to talk. A few of the panelists, at least, will talk about their general path through the research program, which sometimes involves our current, sometimes was outside of current. First is. Uh, Alice May. Um, hi, so I'll start off with my um, four-year experience then about uh, the research I've done in my four years of high school here at Harker. Um, so first you can see that I started research actually in eighth grade with the SRP program at the middle school. And I think a lot of students here do start their uh, research journey in middle school because Harker does offer like really great opportunities to be able to start your research early. Of course, you can also start research in high school and still get really far with it. So personally for me in eighth grade, I did a project in material science and um, I haven't actually returned to material science with my research um, in high school, but I think that just the experience of being able to go through the entire research method and design my own um, experiment, my own project, and also go to a bunch of different science fairs in middle school was really formative for me and enabled me to, like, inspire me and encourage me to continue research in high school. So in high school, in ninth grade, the first project that I did was um, in deep learning. Uh, I call it Deep Guide, but it was basically just a deep learning um, app that enabled um, object detection of pedestrian street traffic signals. Uh, but not to get into too much detail, but basically this project gave me um, an introduction into artificial, intelli artificial intelligence, which is a really hot field right now. Uh, and I think it's also been able to pave the way for my current research. And in ninth grade, I also joined the Harper Research Club, which I've been able to stay in and I'm now president of, as Mr. Steiner mentioned earlier. Um, and I think joining the research club also gave me really great opportunities to meet other Harper students who are also really passionate about research. And it's a really great um, community, uh, support community for Harper students and just one of the many opportunities um, that I've been able to explore research uh, as a Harper student. Uh, and then in 10th grade, I actually did two different research projects. One of them was in summer uh, with the UC Santa Cruz SIP um, like science internship program. Um, and it was kind of my first experience of doing a more uh, formal internship. Um, and it was really great to be able to work at a university setting um, where there's like lots of other people who are like all different levels of uh, students like, for example, undergrad or like a PhD candidate student. Um, and there's just so much teamwork and collaboration happening there um, in every area of science. For me personally, it was in eco-science, which is also another field that I kind of just dabble in for that summer. I haven't actually returned to eco-science either, but it was really great to have that opportunity of collaboration in a university setting. Um, and then the project that I took a bit longer, uh, took, a bit, uh, took a bit further, uh, was a project in bioinformatics. Um, and that's actually the field that I'm most interested in right now. I've done several other projects in 11th grade and 12th grade in bioinformatics, which is basically at the intersection of biology and computer science. And for me personally, I'm looking into genes and gene mutations related to different types of cancers. Um, yeah, and then in 11th grade, I did another project at SIP in neuroscience, and I think that was also that was also in the summer and more just um, for me to explore different fields. I think like in general with science research, it's good to experience um, different fields because there's so many different fields that you might be interested in, and maybe you just have to see if you're interested in that one, or maybe you're not interested in it, but it was good to have that experience, so you know which direction you want to pursue in the future. Um, and then in 12th grade, I did another internship in bioinformatics, um, a virtual internship at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Okay, so I also have been busy. Uh, um, <laughs> I would just add that uh, even if like you're looking at kind of a, a self-selected group here, right? These are 
students for whom research was a good fit. Maybe you take the research methods class and find out, I don't know if I'm ready for this yet. In which case, college is still a great opportunity. Some of us didn't even start research until they got to college. Um, let's move on to the next four-year experience. Uh, Natasha. Okay, um, mine looks a little bit long, but um, like Alice, I was introduced to research through our middle school um, science research program, SRP, and then when I got into high school, um, I did an independent project throughout most of freshman year and um, into sophomore year, so that was on um, synthesizing an organic pesticide for sericulture, which is so far farming, so you'll notice it's a lot different from the other research that I ended up pursuing. Um, and then I also started uh, mentorship through the upper school um, research program there, which is really helpful in me kind of figuring out what I was interested in and how I could get involved in research more in high school. And then over the summer, I did the um, summer science and engineering program at Smith College. So it was all women's and I did a month of coursework in genetics and chemistry, which is really cool. Then in 10th grade, I started taking the research methods class and I um, participated in Synopsis, which was our regional science fair. And then over the summer, I was just kind of trying some things out. So I did bioinformatics, um, a class at Berkeley, and stem cell biology um, class at Brown. And then in junior year, I started taking honors advanced research, which I did both junior and senior year, um, currently taking. And then over the summer, I did a cognitive neuroscience internship. So this was basically writing um, a 25-page paper on original research. So for me, I proposed a new method of um, diagnosing adolescent borderline personality disorder, which was a really great opportunity um, for me to write a more in-depth paper like that. And then, yeah, I actually ended up publishing that paper, which was another great opportunity. And then currently, I've been working since this summer with a lab at Stanford that I just will reach out to, um, which is what I gave my presentation on earlier today. But that's looking at um, public mental health and using media as a suicide prevention tool. Um, yeah, so I would say just generally, um, my research path was not very linear at all. I kind of just tried a little bit of everything until I figured out what I was most interested in, so I would definitely suggest just kind of exploring um, to figure out your interests and what you want to do, um, so just don't feel limited at all. And do you feel like you've settled on the path you'll stay on for a little while now? Uh, yeah, I think that I'm definitely really interested in public mental health, and kind of that field will be what I'm hoping to study more in college, but I'm sure that could also change as I try more things in college, but I'm happy that I did like a little bit of everything in high school. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes things change in college, I'm told. Um, all right, Parker, tell us what this word Yeah, okay, hello. So, like Natasha and Alice, I started my our research journey in high school, or in eighth grade, uh, with the science research program. Uh, there, I worked on a project on scorpion fluorescence, uh, which is the property scorpions have to glow brightly, like a green and blue color under UV light. This is something I continued during my freshman year where I researched the compounds in the scorpion skin that allowed them to have this fluorescent property. Then uh, the next year I continued working on scorpions, but I began to investigate a different property, which is scorpion venom. And more specifically, I studied how scorpion venom regenerates over time, uh, which is an important factor that allows scorpion venom to be used for medical research. Uh, finally, over the past two years, I've been working uh, mostly on ecology and uh, systematics of scorpions. Um, this involves uh, discovering new species of scorpions and writing papers describing them formally, um, uh, in, which includes naming them and also showing how they're different than um, all the other scorpion species that have been found thus far. And also, I've been working on projects on ecological modeling, which is the field of using um, like. Uh, different sets of data to understand the um, to understand the environment in different ways, uh, and look at the distribution patterns of different species um, to understand more about how they live. Yeah, I'll just I'll just highlight that um, Prophet started with a relatively narrow topic, and it's been fun for me to watch over the past four years as he's expanded out into just this diverse range of fields, uh, the complex systems, ecology, computer science, all kinds of tools that he uses. All right, thank you all. That gives you a, kind of a rough sketch of different paths that students might follow through our program. Um, and I'm going I'm to leave it on this slide for the rest of the time. Now we're just going to go to Q&A. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm going to try to anticipate some questions that you might have and pose them to various participants here. So we'll start with, uh, how do you go about selecting a new project? How, like, what's the process like for generating new ideas? And I think we'll start with Harsh. Let's... Um, well, the first time I had to select a new project was in eighth grade for SRP. And the first step I had was kind of imbibing information from a bunch of sources. So I read a lot of Scientific American, and the key factor that made me choose a project, um, which was on investigating combination therapy um, for preventing um, resistant bacteria, was I read a document or I watched a documentary on the Soviet um, bacteriophage program um, after the Second World War, and that was really um, exciting. So I began thinking like, how can I integrate this with antibiotics and possibly come up with like a better way of treating um, um, drug resistant bacteria. So I think definitely have to take in information from a lot of magazines or sources and see what interests you first, and then you can try to investigate. I also think that when you're coming up with a research topic, you shouldn't be completely like attached to it because over the course of your research, you're gonna find new areas of preferred inquiry, which you are gonna have to explore anyways. So definitely like think about choosing someone now and then down the road you're gonna find some other areas which may interest you more, and then you can just go down that path and become more specific. All right, thanks, Arch. And uh, we'll, we'll throw the same question over to Alice. Uh, so just adding on to what Arch already said, so I think there's kind of two ways that you can approach trying to find a new idea. And like the first one is looking into your own life to see like maybe what problems are affecting yourself, the people around you. Like for example, for me, my grandparents have actually gone to lung cancer. So it's an issue that's really personal to me. Um, and that's also why I uh, wanted to study and why I've been able to study it for so long because it like not only impacts uh, myself, my own family, but also so many other people's families as well. Um, and I think like, so when you're looking into a research topic, you can look in, you can consider it from that, like how uh, many people it can impact, whether it can impact yourself and like that way you have your own connection to it and um, it's easier for you to stay motivated to continue research to um, that topic because like research does have a lot of challenges with it that um, we'll also talk about later, but um, it re requires you to be very, um, like motivated to study uh, whatever topic that you're looking into. And I think the other way that you can look for ideas is it's kind of like what Harsh said earlier, is looking into like doing some background research about what might um, interest you, like maybe not looking into your own life, but like into maybe magazines. Like for my um, eighth grade project, I actually went to a local museum. Like I got the inspiration for my project from a museum, the Tech Museum. There's a lot of great museums here in the Silicon Valley that you guys can look at. Um, and like, for example, for me, um, there's like an exhibit, exhibit about mushrooms and how strong they are. And my project was actually about like how you can build bricks out of um, the root of a mushroom as an um, alternative eco-friendly material. Um, and I think that way you can also come up with really interesting and unique project ideas. Great, thank you. And we'll have one more responder or product that you can say. Yeah, so um, I'd like to especially uh, do what um, Alice and Harsh have said. Uh, as Alice said, it's really important to have something that you're interested in and passionate about. For me, that's been researching wildlife. It's been something I've been interested in for my entire life. Um, and I picked scorpions specifically in the eighth grade as they were a group of animals I was already uh, quite interested in. And my interest in scorpions has only grown through my years in high school. And then as Harsh said, one of the most important things to do is not be super set on the project you're doing and be open to any opportunity you see to go down a different, even more interesting path. And I kind of experienced that in the past uh, couple years of high school where um, every time I've been working on scorpions, I've discovered some sort of new problem or some sort of new interesting uh, factor. And I've gone down that path uh, researching more and more. For instance, um, last year when I was working on a uh, description for a new species of scorpion, I realized I wanted to be able to create range maps for it. Um, but I wasn't really satisfied with any range map creation software that already existed. So I began getting into the field of ecological modeling myself and looking at how different climate variables and other sort of geographic data can inform the distribution of species. All right, great, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to a new question. 
Ms. Wong, what was one important challenge you faced in your research pursuits and how have you grown as a result? I will start with Angela. Yeah, so for my research, um, it's quantum physics, which is basically the physics at the really small scale that affects particles like photons and electrons. And so for me, what I found is that I really didn't understand that much quantum physics. It wasn't intuitive. Um, I guess this applies to a lot of fields, but especially in quantum, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and I think in the beginning, I was very nervous of asking questions to my research mentor. So I really looked for online resources. So any concept I wasn't completely comfortable with or was new to me, I would look up. And I found YouTube to be like my heaven. Um, I, I watched so many uh, lectures, whether it was like university lectures or um, people explaining topics. And I found that just watching the video wouldn't help. And I would watch it, take notes, rewatch it, find out I didn't know like specific parts and repeat the cycle um, with every concept I didn't know. And that definitely got a little draining. And so I found that um, watching like some easier animated videos were also fun too, um, to kind of like sprinkle in um, and continue making me love physics. Um, and something I found was that when I watched all these videos and took notes, I created a foundation for myself, but it definitely had holes in it. So the next step I took was taking courses. So I signed up for a year-long quantum computing course, and that helped me, that helped provide the basic foundation for me and fill in those holes. And I think I definitely cherished the time I spent watching videos too, because that made me more inquisitive. It made me cognizant of the holes I had in my knowledge. So that allowed me to utilize the course better by asking questions. And so that was really helpful in solidifying my foundation and applying to my own research. And then um, another thing is that my research mentor would often say, like, if you don't ask any questions, it means you don't understand it. So I found that in asking questions, you really can work on your understanding and you know what parts you don't know, which is a very important thing to know. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely online there's a lot of resources um, if you don't fully understand things, but also just asking questions. Like, people do research because they're passionate about the topic, they love talking about it, so um, realizing that there was this open space to ask questions and really learn was really important. And I know it's very tough to admit you don't know things, but it really paves the way to learning. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, if only I had had YouTube videos when I was studying quantum field theory. I might have taken a different path. Um, uh, not that I'm not thrilled to be here. Uh, right, Natasha, do you have like a one minute version of response to that question? Um, yeah, I will actually echo a lot of what Angela said, but I think for me, um, one challenge was kind of learning how to self advocate and you know, ask those questions if I didn't understand things. And people are actually a lot more willing to help you than you think. Like, I emailed random PhD students just like, hey, I have a question, or like, I want to know more about what you're doing. And surprisingly, a lot of them would answer and then set up calls with me. Um, so I would say definitely kind of coming out of my shell and getting more comfortable with asking people questions and reaching out for help has definitely been a big challenge, but also really rewarding and has been very helpful for me. Perfect, yeah. I, I think a lot of uh, academic researchers are thrilled when high school students contact them and, and are curious about the work they're doing. So something to take advantage of. Um, well, uh, we'll move on to one more question, I think, before uh, we hear from Sasa's father. Uh, what have been the most valuable rewards of doing science research for you? Sasa, we're going to have you at this. Yeah, I would say uh, for me, the rewards have really been knowledge, experience, and uh, creativity. So the knowledge, obviously, uh, as you do research, you learn a lot about the field that you're doing the research in, but also I think on a larger scale, just knowledge about what you do and don't like. Um, I, I've done projects in, uh, in my junior year. I did a project that was very hands-on. It was about like optical physics, where I was studying like, semiconductors. And I really enjoyed that hands-on process. Um, and then sort of a contrasting experience I had was working at home on like bioinformatics in a virtual uh, setting. And what I recognized was that it felt a little like mundane, like boring to me uh, uh, to sort of sit there at home and I, I wanted to have the hands-on experience um, and I enjoyed the research. I learned a lot 
Uh, but it also taught me, like, okay, going forward, I might seek out those hands-on like lab experiences more. Um, so I think that's the knowledge side. Uh, in addition to obviously, you know, every paper you read, every conversation you have with your mentor, uh, that's going to be extremely valuable, not just for that piece of research, but seeing what you do next, what you go on to do. Um, in terms of experience, uh, going to college, uh, college is where research really starts. Um, as much as you do in high school, I think there's a limit to sort of uh, just because you haven't taken the right courses, you haven't you know had the, like that much time in the lab. There are limitations to the extent of research you can do, but whatever experiences you do gain in high school is going to be extremely, extremely useful going into college. Um, and having that baseline is something which a lot of students everywhere else might not have the access might not might not have access to those same opportunities. Uh, so. That's extremely important. It's just getting experience, uh, you know, going through this process of like scientific learning um, and creativity. I mentioned because uh, the way that you do math problems in class, where you know you get a very uh, defined problem and you know there's a solution at the end of it, and you know there's a process to getting to that solution, is just about the opposite of how research works. Uh, the problem is not well defined. Uh, you don't know if there's a solution. You don't know, you know, at, when you start, you think there's going to be a solution, and then you go, you start, and then you realize, like, that there's just so many different uh, other problems in what you're doing, and then whatever you end up with is, um, it, it's valuable in and of itself, but the creativity you need to sort of adapt to whatever problems you may face, change your experiment as, uh, as you face those obstacles, I think that's been super valuable for me, so I'd say those three things. That's great. Thank you all. Um, so uh, again, keep posting your questions if you have any. Uh, we will have some time for those. First, I want to uh, more formally introduce Salah's father, Mr. Mani Ramachandran. Um, he is father also to Nilesh, who graduated four years ago. I taught him as well. Um, so both of the brothers started the research journeys in middle school. Um, and then when they got to the high school, they eventually became research club officers. Um, they worked in the open lab program, had summer internships were involved in the research mentoring programs. Uh, they participated in competitions supported by Harker. So they've, they've had pretty much the full range of experiences, which means Mr. Ramachandran has also seen from, from some perspective that full range of experiences. So we'll invite him to speak directly to the parents in the audience here for a few minutes. Thank you, Mr. Spenner. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk about uh, the experience I had with my two sons going to the art of research program. It was a fantastic experience and they really enjoyed every bit of it. And what you will see with this is that I'm going to talk about a few pointers that I have, and everybody finds it on back in the blog work for them. So if you look at Parker in terms of uh, what they expect, they expect the parents to support it, and you obviously are all extremely supportive of your, of your students. That's the first step, and that obviously is necessary. And the school also provides an extremely good level of support for what students need to be able to do to the various school their projects. What has worked for us in our case has been a very informal and impromptu process of introducing the kids to a wide range of topics, discussions about science skills, discussions about science research, the advancements in this thing, as a typical dinner table conversation where it was not really any formal interaction or anything, but just related to other topics in general and we would just reduce science. That has worked extremely well for us. And the kids, you know, all kids are extremely curious by nature. And what has worked for us is to just encourage that curiosity, continue on the path of discovery, encourage them to ask questions, and then they will find there are things that they can do and now the research is a multi-year endeavor. As Mr. Spiller said, most of us don't get to do research till we attend grad school or, you know, or a PhD. But uh, it is very important for them to get an early start, and it is possible for them to get a very good basis in the scientific process in high school. And that gives them an understanding of the process and also the challenges that it entails. And what it is that they can do is get a good understanding of how to move about this process systematically. Um, if you look at the uh, overall, it has, you know, 
very good resources. He mentioned all the clubs, there are so open lab, there is the uh, internships and internships, and all these uh, clubs also have uh, you know very interactive activities. USA YPT, for example, is very hands-on. My own kids were very hands-on in their, uh, or they were, you know, interested in hands-on activities. What we found was that they gravitated towards the experimental side of these, and they found that they enjoyed those more, so they will uh, be very creative with creating the setups, taking measurements. All that is all part of the learning process. But that, that doesn't mean that they're not a uh, multitude of other venues. You know, they can do uh, computing, uh, you know, they can do computational research. It's more and more common for them to apply computational processes to protein studies, cell biology, astronomy, environmental science. So there's no limit to what people can do these days with the resources that they have. Um, and the last thing I'm saying is that, you know, students need to be aware that the timeline is very, very critical and parents who can help them manage the timeline uh, in terms of encouraging them to think through the process, maybe start in summer, but the stress is much less. You know, if you can get that thing done earlier, the stress is much less. And this is always a multi-year process. Typically, you are trying to condense this to a few months. So be realistic about the goals and what it is that can be achieved. And once the goals are defined well, the heart research staff is extremely knowledgeable about what this realistic goal is to achieve and going with an open mind. And then you, you know you find that success is really a very natural consequence. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll I'll help you have a support. I'll just restate the importance of um, being realistic about what you can accomplish in a given amount of time. I think a lot of students start out with really big dreams of what they're going to do in their first project. Uh, and sometimes it's really better to start with something very simple and let it grow if it works and just follow whatever path it takes you on. Um, all right, so we're going to transition now to audience Q&A. So I'll hand it over to Kavita to handle it. Hey, thank you guys all for your great answers to the questions. Just to preface it, we have quite a few questions and we don't have that much time. So the emails for everybody are listed over there. So if you have any specific questions for any members of the panel, I'm sure they would love to respond. So feel free to shoot them an email if you have any questions that aren't able to be answered. So the first one, I think Sasquatch's dad did a great job of talking about what a parent can do to support their child. So I guess Proctor has a specific question, but I'll just pose it for everybody. What got you interested in science? And then I guess for Proctor, what got you interested in scorpions? How did you choose your topic? I guess for all of you guys, would I have more like Angela and Tasha, Parnish, Alice, so you guys all have interesting fields that you're interested in, so maybe elaborate a little on that, but we'll start with Proctor, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I've been interested in wildlife um, for my entire life, um, and scorpions are something that are like a really unique but really understudied group here in California. Um, the Western U.S. and Northern Mexico has some of the highest scorpion diversity anywhere in the world, just because of the structure of the way that uh, some of our desert landscapes are. Um, and this makes studying scorpions in this area really, really fascinating. One of the fields I find most interesting is ecology and evolutionary biology, which is the study of kind of the evolutionary history of different organisms and also the way they live in their environments. And scorpions are just like a really excellent way of studying these, um, studying these fields in California, where we live. Yeah, so I guess I'm going next. Um, I'm, I love quantum physics, um, quantum computing. I could talk about it for hours, but I'll keep it short. Um, it's just so, it seems so counterintuitive, but the more you think about it, um, things make sense. Uh, in quantum, things are random. Sometimes you can't predict things. Um, and there's just so many cool applications. It's not just a completely um, theoretical or natural science field. There's so many implications in um, computers, and so that's the direction I really want to head in. Um, but just overall, I feel like learning about quantum, it's the science at the smallest of scales. Um, you really can't, it's, it's a field that's continuing. Um, you're learning stuff every day, and I just really want to be part of that exploration. Um, yeah. 
Okay, that's great. Um, this is a little adding on to one of the questions that was asked, but what are the main challenges that you face and what advice would you give yourself at the beginning of your research process? Uh, I guess I can answer this. Um, during my 10th and 11th grade year, I did research using um, neural networks. And one of the major issues I faced was that most of the time, the neural networks wouldn't reach a, uh, sufficient accuracy on the task that at hand. So oftentimes I had to reach out to professors at various universities who were doing cutting-edge research with new architectures for their neural networks. And that's sort of a way I was able to overcome the challenges um, inherent with like, like my traditional approaches. So reaching out and asking to others for help who may have um, more experience than you do. Does anybody want to talk about the advice question? Uh, I can, I can uh, speak to that. Uh, so in terms of advice, I would say uh, un unless you choose a project that you're uh, very curious about, very interested in, uh, the, the days where, uh, for me, uh, I studied in my freshman and sophomore year, I was studying tardigrades, which are water bears, um, and they're curious, interesting creatures, but unless I was very interested in them, I wouldn't have found, I wouldn't have found the energy to wake up like an hour earlier to come in during my free period in Mr. Spinner's uh, classroom to, to work on it. And so the advice I would give myself is uh, spend maybe the extra, you know, week, two weeks, uh, make, like sort of outlining what you think uh, you, where you might go with that research and what you personally can take away from it. So even if your results go completely wrong, you don't even get results, let's say, you know, consider those scenarios, uh, or I would tell myself to consider those scenarios a little bit more carefully and see whether you still feel just as excited about the research. Uh, because if you do, then it's perfect for you. And uh, if you don't, then maybe you can see how to tweak that project or take it in a direction that uh, you can maintain that sense of curiosity even with without such hopeful prospects of uh, fantastic results. Uh, yeah, kind of adding on to what Saswan said, it's really important to make sure you're actually really excited about your research and you kind of know what you're getting into when you're working on a project. Um, I know for my projects on scorpions, a lot of the research really just involves like hours and hours of busy work measuring scorpion segments, like different segments of scorpions. And if I wasn't really, really interested in scorpions, there's no way I'd have patience to put up with it because it's, it's kind of awful. So um, yeah, make sure that whatever research project you're getting into is something that you're actually going to have the excitement and interest to continue. Otherwise, you're just going to be sad. Uh, adding on to what you guys said about finding a topic that you love, what would you guys say are the biggest rewards of your research, and what do you find the most interesting part of each of your respective fields? Um, I can start with this question. So, um, I think some of the uh, most biggest rewards from the research. Um, so, I think for me personally, it's um, being able to like the experience and of having so much fun with doing the research. Uh, so like for me, um, I'm interested again in um, bioinformatics and bioinformatics has a lot of like computational, a lot of computational um, aspects to it um, and it also has a lot of wet lab aspects and I think that's like a really great um, combination for me personally because I just have so much fun with the, like, with the wet lab stuff, it's so hands on, you can like work with chemicals um, and pipettes um, and cell cultures and you can watch the cells grow as you do different experiments on them and I think it's really fun to be able to have that experience. Um, it like really um, just brings a lot of energy into me when I'm like in the lab and working on those uh, cell cultures. Um, and then I think on the other hand, um, on the other side, there's like the more computational side. Um, and for my own projects, um, it kind of took the, and like there are kind of two forms of computational. So one of them was like actually coding and I learned a, a lot about coding. Uh, uh, actually more specifically with like deep learning models um, applied to different genetic data. Um, and I think um, I learned a lot about coding and I think that's like rewarding by itself because uh, I think in a lot of fields these days um, it's hard to go without computer science and I gained a lot of experience in that which I'm sure I'll be able to apply to uh, my future research even if it might not be in bioinformatics. Um, I think on the other hand, I was able to learn to approach problems in different ways um, because like a lot of times your code just doesn't work, you have to find different ways to debug it. Even if you look through all of the forums, it might 
like you might still not be able to find a solution for your specific case. Um, and I think that definitely got me um, into like a different kind of mindset to be able to approach problems in a more creative way. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think like those are probably the rewards for me, like both being able to have fun and also being able to gain a lot of skills that I can apply in the future to not just science, but basically my whole life. Um, yeah, I agree with Alice. I think definitely a big reward for me is just being able to create something. I've been very lucky in that all my mentors uh, have given me a lot of freedom to basically just design any project that I want and then they would help um, kind of support me. So I think just being able to create something and then you look back once you've been working on it for months and months and like your project is your baby and you're like, wow, like I created that um, whole thing. So I would say that's definitely rewarding for me. And um, in my senior year research, I'm also getting to do a lot more on like the application side of things. Um, like I'm using my research to present it to like the California State Assembly um, on legislation on protecting kids online. So just kind of seeing that the work that I'm doing as a high schooler is actually going to be able to be um, applicable at that scale has also been really rewarding and exciting for me. Okay, so I think you guys talked a little bit about choosing a topic. Does anybody want to speak to how Parker, the Parker Research Program, helped them choose a topic or any support that they thought was helpful in the process of choosing a topic? Oh, yeah. Uh, you guys can definitely add on, but I, I just wanted to actually say, I, I, even though we often emphasize the importance of finding a topic you're really excited about, sometimes you don't know at first. And so I do maintain a, uh, a basically a database, a website of old projects, right? Documentation is a really important part of doing good science. So I store all that stuff. Uh, the, the website is called Archive, obviously. And, um, and so students often go there and just sit through old projects to get inspiration for what they might want to do. It kind of gives them a sense also of what's possible to be done uh, at work. But feel free to add on to that. Yeah, um, in research class, we spend quite a lot of time discussing each other's projects, talking about our own projects with other people, and kind of getting introduced to many, many different fields of science. In our research class, we have, um, like, I'm working on ecology, uh, Angela's working on her quantum physics, we have people working on computational biology, as you heard, um, but we also have, like, astronomy and, um, ge like, geology or earth science. We have projects from almost every field of science in our research class, and that gives you a really great opportunity to see what, um, like, all the different fields that you could be doing research in. And it's very inspiring and gives, um, gives you a lot of ideas of different types of projects you can approach. Uh, adding on in research class, I think something that was very valuable was the journal clubs, which we had quite often. Um, in this process, someone selects an article and then everyone reads it, and we spend a full class time discussing it. So that could give you some ideas, like, as a springboard, for what future research research for you could like look like. So building on some of these ideas. And also exposing you to like new scientific ideas. Yeah, so um, I haven't taken quite as many semesters of research as Prophet, as he loves to tell me. Um, but so when I started research, it was when quarantine had started. So for me my research journey was very um, lonely. Um, no, it was just um, I was kind of doing stuff on my own, uh, doing Zoom meetings with my research mentor. So joining the research class this last semester, um, it was just so crazy to kind of see everyone's projects, hear people talk about their projects, and the passion in their voices. It was really infectious. Um, just talking to people about research made me so much more motivated to continue with my own. And also sharing resources with each other. Um, we do presentations about our research um, and wish a classmate. <laughs> I think Misham is here. Um, he gave me um, ideas for what conferences I could do. So just being in that collaborative environment is just so refreshing, especially after quarantine. Thank you guys for that answer. I think did better as well. I think we only have time for one more question, but like I mentioned before, feel free to email any of the people on the list if you have any other questions. So this last question is, how do you guys manage research with your other classes, so your schoolwork, your extracurricular sports? Um, music, whatever it may be. Um, I can I, I can start with this question. So I think like um a big thing for me personally was like kind of was figuring out which eras I'm most interested in, whether that's like sports. Like I um I do space, I do do a sport, and that takes up a lot of time. 
and also like figure out what other interests I uh, have, like for example, science research. Um, and I also like research center kind of indicated I, I was, I'm in a lot of clubs, um, and I was in even more clubs in ninth grade, and I think a big part was being able to narrow it down, because um, as a Harvard student, like clubs definitely take up a lot of your time, because there are just so many clubs um, available for you, and I think you want to narrow down which, like, for, like, specifically for clubs, you want to narrow down which ones you're most interested in. So for me, that was research club and medical club, uh, which are like the two clubs I'm most involved in as a senior now. Um, and I think you want to take advantage of your kind of free time as a freshman to make uh, some of those decisions and also to explore the opportunities that you do have. Like, um, like as a freshman, you definitely have more time than your later years of high school. And I think it's a good idea to use that um, after a time to figure out like which kind of which kind of aspects of your life that you want to focus most on because you will not be able to do all of them or at least you won't be able to like commit a lot of time to all of them um, and I think it's better to be able to pick out the few that you're like the most rather than trying to like spread your time over all of them and not really be able to enjoy all of them as much. Uh, and I think uh, just to add on I, I think the other aspect uh, besides just the amount of time you have is when you can spend uh, the time on research. So for example, uh, I mentioned tardigrades in freshman year. That's an in-person uh, research. I have to be in the lab working on it. So for me, the time that I could find was, uh, given the timeline of like, I was trying to submit for synopsis, which is in March, so I needed to get most of my data in by January, and I have soccer that starts in November. So for me, I recognized earlier on, just by looking at my schedule and seeing what my activities would be, uh, when I would have the most time, and specifically soccer, the, the conflict for any sport is typically it starts like right after school. Um, so then I thought, uh, at least in sophomore year, um, I made sure to have a free period so I said if I did want to do research, I could potentially use that free period to come uh, and do research then, or at least uh, see uh, in terms of scheduling when I do the research to start it earlier in the year so that after soccer starts, um, I'm mostly analyzing data, things I can do from home, so I think it's also important to consider, uh, I guess, um, what, the, what resources you might be needing to do that research and when you'll have the most access to those and then focus your time then, whether that's summer, uh, earlier in the year, later in the year, uh, whatever that might be for you, that'll fit into your schedule. Yeah, I think that was our last question. So thank you guys, everybody on the panel, and Mr. Spenner too, for all their hard work and planning and preparing for this panel. They're also hardworking, so I feel like if any of you guys emailed them, they would be so happy to share their own experiences and pass on what they've learned. But that was our final event for the day. Thank you guys so much for... Oh, I'm so... yeah, and, uh, we'll, we'll actually close with Ms. Chetty saying a few closing words. Everybody else already got it before. This is just for the people that did. No, I didn't that one. Thank you everyone for staying after such a long day. I'm sure you must be very tired, but I know that this was definitely worth it. Um, the spirit behind the research symposium is to allow students in a non-competitive setting to share what they learned. And I think there's a, a really important message that you might have heard as you heard these accomplished seniors describe each of their own individual paths. The most important thing is that it was not about a prize that they were going to win. It's about their own personal journey of exploration. And I think as parents and as teachers, all we can do is expose them and support them at the same time. And you can see that one of the most important things that they may have discovered is that science is messy, it's serendipitous, uh, that you're going to make mistakes, but notice how many times they changed their paths and discovered so many other new things that they didn't realize uh, they, they would be interested in. So as you sit there, I know many of you have middle school um, children and you are a middle schooler. I think it's important for you to listen to what they've said and to go out there and find what interests you personally. And it's not about any prize that you're going to win. So 
Thank you for attending. We've been doing it for 16 years now. It's so wonderful to see our alumni come back. You can see how successful our program is simply by listening to them and by listening to our alumni. So good luck and enjoy your summer and happy researching.